databases store information on disk. Uh, but before I get to that, two things. First off, a couple of announcements. So if you're interested in uh, getting access to the departmental Oracle server, uh, mostly just so you can play around with uh, SQL, run some tests, experiments, uh, this is mostly for your own benefit. It's not required for the class. But if you're interested, uh, email me uh, with your UBIT, and uh, I will send you the login inf your login information for that server. Uh, point the second, some of you may have noticed uh, I've been trying to set up a camera in the class. I finally got to the point where uh, it's successfully recording the entire class, so I'll be posting those online. Uh, some of you may have already noticed that Wednesday's lecture was posted. Uh, and finally, uh, homework one is due tonight. Um, I'll be posting homework two uh, later on uh, tonight as well. And that'll be due uh, next week. All right, any questions? Okay. Any questions on the homework that haven't already been answered on Piazza? Deep seated issues with SQL? Okay, in that case, y'all shouldn't have a problem uh, with this simple review question. So I have, have here, uh, well that's supposed to be yellow, but I have here a Venn diagram of the officer's relation and the visited relation. The same thing we've been working with in class for a while. Now a typical join is going to return all pairs that appear in the intersection of these two. But what if we want the result to include a set of officers uh, who have never visited a planet. That is to say, officers with an officer ID that does not appear in the visited relation. Hmm? Left outer joint. You're actually skipping ahead of me here. Uh, but yes, exactly. Um, so essentially what we want to do is to compute a, a, an output where uh, where the tuples that appear in the officer's relation but don't have a corresponding matching tuple in the visited relation uh, appear uh, with, in the result set with uh, essentially a null value for the, the attributes that, have, uh, that come from the visited relation. So uh, just as a quick introductory exercise to get your brains warmed up, how would you compute this using only the relational op algebra operators that we've covered up to this point? How would you implement uh, this, uh, say, left outer join uh, using just the relational algebra operators that we've covered? Set difference. Set difference, OK. Where are you going to difference? Left? OK, so set difference. What's on the left-hand side? Officers, OK. What else do we need? I'm uh, hearing projection. What's, uh, what are we projecting? Name. Name. OK. Project name from officers? Officers across. OK, what's that going to compute? What's this going to compute? One uh, officer's cross visited is going to give us one uh, copy of each officer name or each. Uh, well, actually, since we're doing set operators. 
So how would we detect that there is no officer ID in visited for a particular officer ID in officers? Okay, what, uh, what officer IDs are in visited? Uh, well, there are three of them, but how do we get the, the officer IDs in visited? Project, good. How do we get the, uh, okay, so now, now what do we need to do? We need to find the officer IDs in officers, the officer IDs in visited, and do what? I heard set difference, good. So, no erasers. So, project officer ID uh, from officers project uh, officer ID from visited. And that gives us what? Just three, just the doubles that are in officers that don't, or just the officer IDs that are in officers but not in visited. Now what do we need to do? Projection of name. So we don't have a name in here, but we need, uh, how do we get the name? So this is just a list of officer IDs. How do we get the name? Cross or join. Good. With officers. Okay, now what do we, so that gives us that. Uh, now there's one sort of hidden feature of projection that I've kind of swept under 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 the rug. Uh, projection can also be used to uh, essentially evaluate expression, so we can create additional attributes as well. And in this, in this case, what do we need to do to uh, get the other half of, uh, of the attribute in the output? Or sorry, the other half of the row in the output? We need to project name. I've heard that plenty. What, well, what else do we need to do? Planet, and the planet for this couple is going to be no. Okay. So we can project name and no. And what do we need? To, oh, what do we need to do with that expression? So that's going to compute out of this output set. That's going to compute what? Just just this row. Good. Uh, so how do we get the rest? Join, join and, and for, well, how do we get, uh, so how would we, let's ignore that tuple for the moment, how would we get the rest? Join, join on ID, okay. So if we have something that computes this set of tuples, we have something that computes this set of tuples, what do we do? Union, good, okay. And there we have it. In, less sprawly form. Uh, okay, so uh, this this occurs often enough that uh, there's actually there's a term for this that's known as an outer join. Um, the general syntax for this is select uh, and then in the from clause you're going to put this left outer join instead of a comma in between uh, two different relations. Uh, and afterwards, you can put the, the join condition as, as essentially part of the front clause. Um, and just to hammer this point home, uh, looking at our Venn diagram, the join gives us everything in the intersection. A left outer join gives us everything uh, from the left side uh, and the intersection. A right outer join is going to give us everything from the right hand side and the intersection and a full outer join going to give us both. Okay, moving on, uh, one last bit. Uh, so to recap what we covered on Wednesday, uh, all, the all the computations that a SQL processor is going to do are basically going to be done on data that's in RAM. Um, data might need to be stored on hard disk. Why? RAM is volatile and, and it's costly, yeah. Uh, and, yeah, basically. Um, now, there's sort of a problem that I alluded to on Wednesday, which is that um, hard disks typically op operate on the granularity of the pages, uh, whereas queries operate on individual records. So we basically need a mechanism to uh, basically organize all of the records uh, in uh, the various pages that we have 
our database. So just to introduce a little bit of terminology here, uh, we're, there's sort of a hierarchy of, of data organization. Um, a database ha is composed of a set of files. Uh, a file is a collection of pages. A page is a collection of records. And a record is, uh, of course, the data values that you're going to be querying. And what we want to do, and what we're going to cover today, uh, is basically sort of the, the, the design considerations uh, that we're going to need to address in order to efficiently uh, access the records that are on disk and uh, that, that can bring them into memory, uh, the, the various mechanisms that can bring those records into memory uh, as needed. So, yeah, essentially, Kate, uh, hold that thought for, uh, hold that thought for about a slide. Um, so, uh, more concretely, I'm going to focus on a part of the system called the buffer manager. Uh, which essentially provides a very straightforward API, uh, which is uh, allocate pages, uh, that is to say, I need more space to store my data, um, I'm done with this space that I've been using to store my data, uh, and then uh, various uh, features that allow you to access uh, or guarantee that you will be able to access uh, that data. And more concretely, uh, so anyone who's taken an operating systems class, uh, this should also be fairly familiar. Uh, databases uh, reinvent a lot of the, the operating system's wheel, and uh, as we'll see in a moment, there's a fairly good reason for that. Um, but essentially, the, the buffer manager consists of essentially a very big array of, of disk pages. Um, disk pages that are located in memory. And again, uh, a little bit of, this is mostly going to be terminology. Um, a disk page is, is uh, well, define that already. Uh, the buffer manager has essentially this big array of slots for the disk pages that can reside in memory. These are called frames. Um, a page is loaded into a frame. We might then need to uh, remove a page from memory, uh, put it back onto disk, and there's uh, a policy or a page replacement policy that guides how we're going to go about doing that. And when, uh, when a query, at some point, uh, basically when one of the higher levels of the, of, of the database system uh, requests a page or uh, needs access to a particular page, it's going to do something called pinning the page, which is essentially just saying, I need access to this page. Uh, make sure it, never le it doesn't leave memory. Um, this is what you might think of as reference counting in a uh, memory management system. Um, so if the page is in the buffer pool, uh, oh, sorry, this, uh, this, is, this giant array of things is known as the buffer pool. Uh, so if the page is in the buffer pool, uh, great, uh, just let the user know that their, their request is ready to be satisfied. Uh, otherwise, you might need to take a page and evict it, and this is basically going to involve uh, writing the, the contents of the, the uh, frame back to disk. And once that happens, you can say, okay, this page is pinned and the user uh, is, is ready. Uh, now, the sort of the, the key thing, the key insight that uh, distinguishes a database management system from an operating system here uh, is that the database management system knows pretty much what pages any request is going to need, or can very efficiently compute uh, which pages a request is going to need, uh, which means that it can prefetch these, uh, these pages. It can basically say, okay, these, these are the pages that I need. Um, make sure that they're available for me uh, as I'm running the query. Uh, so to get a little bit deeper into the API for this, um, higher levels of the, data, the, la the layers above the database management system are going to send requests to pin pages. Uh, and that basically indicates that the higher level is, being that is using that particular of course, this also means that the higher level needs to uh, unpin the page uh, when it's done with the data. And of course, indicate whether that data has been modified. And if it has been modified, then when that particular page gets free, uh, it ends up getting uh, written back to disk. Uh, we'll come back to this a little bit uh, more uh, in, in more depth a bit further down the line when we talk about concurrency control and recovery. Uh, because this, this is where a lot of the nastiness happens. Um, 
especially when we need to ensure that a particular uh, update can be recovered. But we'll get to that a bit later on. Professor? Yes? Uh, can you give an example of how exactly DBMS knows uh, what pages it needs to read? Hold that question for about three slides. Yeah, about three. Um, okay, so the if, uh, if the, bu uh, the buffer pool is full, the buffer manager is going to have to pick one of the, the uh, frames to replace. Uh, it will do this using a buffer replacement policy. Uh, does, uh, uh, can I get a show of hands for uh, who understands the phrase LRU or uh, least recently used uh, replacement policy? Good, okay. I, really hoping I wouldn't have to, to cover this. Um, okay, so essentially this should be fairly old hat to you guys. Um, the, the policies that are used here are fairly standard and for certain special, uh, special purpose database management systems, uh, they're going to be tuned. Uh, in general, it'll be the role of some human sitting next to the database uh, to sort of look at the, the various um, database logs and make sure that uh, the, the replacement policy is performing uh, well enough. And if it's not, then basically this is, this is something that can't really be automated. Um, for most of you have sort of encountered this sort of worst case, uh, least recently used uh, scenario where uh, your, your uh, buffer pool size, or the equivalent of the buffer pool, uh, is let's say eight pages, and you need to read nine records sequentially. And so you keep paging out the, the last thing that uh, that you read. Oh, sorry, you keep paging out uh, the thing eight steps behind you, and it turns out two more steps down the line you need to read that. Um, okay. Uh, but it, anyway, this this is something that is typically uh, given given to a human to, to solve. In general, something like uh, least recently used uh, is is fairly common. Um, okay, so um, as I've been sort of hammering on uh, this 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 idea that most of this, if if you've taken an operating systems course, the operating system already does. Uh, most of what I've just described in some way, shape, or form. Um, now, why don't we just say, uh, okay, let, uh, the operating system can, can handle all this. Why, do we, uh, why does the database try and uh, outthink the operating system? Uh, well, the, the first, and, and this is sort of the originally uh, major motivation for this when uh, DBMSs were first getting created, and, it's the question of portability. So different operating systems might not necessarily support the same set of features. Uh, for example, uh, an operating system might not, not necessarily uh, support um, forcing data to disk. And it's the database's responsibility to sort of ensure that uh, data can be forced to disk uh, regardless of what operating system it's running on. Um, there's a couple of sort of minor limitations where databases have uh, gotten a bit of an advantage, uh, such as, for example, files not being able to span disks. Um, RAID kind of addresses that, but databases can, can sort of um, incorporate their own uh, their own allocation policies there as well. Uh, and finally, uh, and th this is sort of the big issue, um, databases essentially have their own um, access patterns. So data, if you ask a query, um, the database is going to have a much better sense of what data it needs to read than the operating system. Uh, the operating system is designed to be extremely general purpose. It's uh, designed to sort of infer what sort of access, the, the sort of file systems are designed to infer the sort of access patterns uh, that a uh, user is, is um, requesting. Whereas a database already knows the access pattern that it's going to, to need, uh, it's going to be using. So it can um, more aggressively uh, prefetch data, and it can prefetch data a little more intelligently. Uh, so let me give you a, a bit of an example of that. 
Um, here we have a very simple query, uh, nothing more than a scan uh, of the officer's relation where uh, the officer is on the USS Enterprise. Now let's say for the sake of argument um, that this officer's table is a sorted file. So, uh, or is stored in a sorted file, and specifically sorted on the ship column. Uh, furthermore, let's say that we have some additional uh, catalog or, or data structure that tells us uh, essentially where the boundaries are uh, between them, uh, between different ships. So it can, uh, this, this sort of index structure is something we'll talk about um, probably early, uh, later on next week. Uh, with a typical operating system, uh, so you have your disk, you have your RAM, and then you have some supplemental data structure that tells you, and uh, does this roughly answer your question? Uh, supplemental data structure that says, okay, the, uh, the data for um, officers on the enterprise is going to be uh, organized across those three pages. Now, if we rely on operating system paging, then sort of the, the first interaction with the file system that we really have is this read operation. So uh, when the database comes along and says, okay, let me read a particular uh, file on, on the disk, it'll take the operating system a few moments uh, to, to actually uh, satisfy that read. Now, okay, the read, uh, we, we do whatever processing is necessary, and we move along the, uh, the file, and we eventually get to the end of the page. Well, when we get to the end of the page, the operating system is going to have to page the next page in. And, you know, maybe, maybe the operating system is actually fairly smart. Um, it realizes, hey, this, this uh, person is, is doing, a, this, this program is doing a sequential scan through the file. Great, I know how to handle that. I'm going to just page in the entire rest of the file. Uh, well, okay, great. You've just paged in the rest of the file, but now the last, uh, now you've actually paged in too much information. And so this is, the operating system does an amazing job here. Uh, trying to sort of, it can do an amazing job trying to figure out uh, what the database is, is trying to read, but it doesn't necessarily make sense to uh, force the operating system to do this when the database already knows uh, that it's just going to access those three pages. So it can start paging them in, and as soon as they're available, it can start actually using them. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the, the motivation for why we're reinventing the wheel here. Um, now, what does that wheel look like? Well, as I said, uh, a, database is, uh, a database consists of files, and a file consists of pages, and a page consists of records. So let's start from the bottom here. What does one of these records look like? Uh, well, one uh, pos I'm going to show you basically a couple of, of potential layouts that are, are frequently used. And the first of these is to just use a fixed length record. Um, so you have some base address where uh, the, the record starts, and then because you know how big each field is, uh, if you need to access, let's say, the third field in this record, uh, you know precisely that it's going to be at whatever the base address is, plus um, the size of the first two records. Um, thoughts? Uh, what, are, what are benefits, drawbacks to this particular representation? Anyone think of a better representation, possibly, or, or uh, something that this doesn't do? Okay, um, 
There's actually one other benefit uh, that we'll get to um, shortly. But first, uh, okay, so maybe we want to have variable size records. How can, how can we indicate that? Well, one possible way is to use delimiters. We have a certain character that we put in between uh, every single record. Um, thoughts? Yes. Yep, so anytime you, you change one of the, well, change the size of one of the fields, um, then you're going to have to rewrite the entire record. Um, anything else? Exactly, so the, the character um, has to be one that you're guaranteed never to see in the data. Um, now there's actually, sort of the, the main advantage to this particular format, or at least two major advantages, um, that are not, uh, anyone think of any major advantages of, of this, this format? Fields can be, okay, so fields can be any size. So what if uh, the data is, um, the, okay, so the data can be made as small as, as you want. Um, what if a human is trying to look at this? And this doesn't happen very often, but uh, what if, if you're trying to, uh, what's a good example of this particular format that probably most of you have been talking about? Thomas, yeah, so exactly, this is, this is a great format for, for basically giving information to, to humans to look at. Um, one other sort of subtle advantage of this is that you can detect buffer, uh, buffer overflows. So if, uh, or, well, there, there is no real uh, notion of a buffer overflow here because the, the characters are where they are. Um, but is there any other way to store sort of variable size fields? Has anyone ever programmed with Pascal? Used strings in Pascal? Okay, now I'm really dating myself. Uh, okay, so one other format is uh, to use, uh, to start off the record with sort of an array of field offsets. Um, basically say, okay, the first field of the record starts here and, and so forth. Uh, what about this format? Any, any thoughts? Advantages, disadvantages? Yes, so you can access individual fields in constant time. Here. Right, so we have the same problem that we did with the delimiters. If you, uh, re if you change the size of one of the fields, you need to change, uh, rewrite a large chunk of the record. So what about number of fields? We've been using very, very structured data so far, but um, there's a lot of, sort of less structured information. One of the downsides here, is, so how many, uh, so what if we wanted to add a sixth record? You'd have to shift everything, but you'd also have to change uh, the structure. So when, when someone, the, you need information outside of the file to sort of uh, figure out what kind of data you're, you're storing in this particular um, Okay. Um, oh, and uh, of course, the, so what I was addressing, uh, what I was mentioning earlier, uh, there's also sort of the possibility of, of buffer overflow. So if you, um, if you accidentally write more characters to this first field than fit, then you're going to end up clobbering data in the second field. Yeah. Um, so you could potentially also add a number of fields column in here as well. Okay. So how do we store? Uh, okay. So that's a couple of ways of storing records on disk. Um, what about if we want to store, uh, so how do we store records within a page? There's a couple of ways of doing this. Um, the, probably the two most common are to use this sort of path structure where you allocate, where you take an entire page, you subdivide it into essentially n slots, and each of these slots holds one record. 
Um, and there are two ways of, of doing this. You either have uh, sort of a, a cutoff point where everything before the cutoff point uh, is a filled record, everything after the cutoff record is free space. Of course, I have to store it where that cutoff point is. Or you can just have uh, each slot allocated willy nilly, but then you have uh, a bitmap here that says which slots are occupied. Um, again, that's, uh, uh, what, are, what are advantages and disadvantages of each of these? Exactly. So both of these have um, are incompatible with variable size, uh, variable length records. But the fragmentation is possible to rule out the square. <coughs> because uh, what if I'm going to insert more records and uh, maybe five, mm -hmm. and I don't have five space, I have to compress. So well, so uh, I. In either case, you're going. You have the same exact number of records possible. And in both cases, you can't store more than n records. In um, so each each of these slots uh, has exactly enough space for, for one record. Um, hold that thought. Uh, that thought. That specific thought. Uh, hold it for about one slide. Uh, but in this in this particular case, uh, fragmentation is is not an issue because each each slot occupies. Uh, sorry, each record occupies exactly one slot. Um, but there is sort of an issue with, with finding free slots. So how, how long does it take to find a free slot here? Yeah, it's, just, it's constant time to find the first record, the first free slot. Um, here, it's not necessarily constant time, uh, although in, in practice, you're, you're basically talking about uh, bunch of comparisons, or a fixed number of comparisons, so it's not necessarily that bad. Um, now there is, however, uh, sort of um, one major advantage uh, to this particular layout. Um, what if you're, so what if you're scanning the data? Which of them is, is better? What? Yes, so you're, you're scanning uh, it's not necessarily that it's sequential, but right. So once you hit this portion of the free space, uh, you know that, 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 that there's nothing in here, so you only need to scan up to the, the cutoff point. Uh, so you end up looking at less memory. Um, now that said, uh, unpacked also has a nice advantage in that you don't need to reorder the records. So in this case, what happens when you delete a record? Shift everything up or reorganize it, which is a real problem, especially if the data is organized in some uh, specific way, such as if the data is sorted. Um, in this case, it's much easier to do deletions and possibly even uh, subsequent insertions. OK. Um, so this is uh, one of the, the major limitations. In fact, the first major limitation that uh, we came up with for this was that it requires fixed size records. Um, you could also potentially talk about variable size records. Now, anyone who is uh, quick show of hands, has anyone implement, uh, who has implemented malloc or some equivalent? Okay. So, you, okay. So a couple of people in the class understand the pain and suffering. Um, Okay, so the, in general, we don't want to do anything quite as, as complex as, as keeping track of, of data, pretty much exactly for this, this fragmentation issue. Um, so typically what will happen in a database uh, is that if we do need to store variable size, variable length records, uh, we'll end up with a page layout that looks kind of like this, where the records are kind of scattered throughout and any time you need to append a record, you just uh, you have keep around sort of a pointer to the first byte of, of the free space, and we just sort of write uh, the record uh, into place there. Um, now the advantage of this is that we end up with, uh, we end up being able to support variable length records, but um, at the same time, there's potentially going to be a lot of wasted space if you do deletions. So 
fragmentation, which needs to get resolved, um, usually through some sort of garbage collection or cleanup process that happens whenever people aren't querying the database. Um, any other thoughts on what sort of advantages, disadvantages show up here? One specific one that's, uh, one specific disadvantage that is fairly nasty that orders uh, you here. So if I say the phrase, uh, uh, if I say the phrase cache lines, okay. Okay, so there's, uh, if you recall back, uh, back to Wednesday, I had that big memory hierarchy slide up. Um, we, towards the top uh, was the cache. And the cache tends to be organized in, in sort of this very, uh, uh, into yeah, what, what are called cache lines, which are basically certain regions of memory that can get loaded into cache at once. And if you scatter your records all throughout the page, it's much harder uh, to ensure that the entire record falls on one cache line, which essentially means that the processor is, the processor is going to have to do, or sorry, not the processor, the, the memory bus is going to have to do twice as much work uh, to get uh, information into cache. Uh, but that's sort of really, really nitpicky at this point. Okay, um, so we've talked about how uh, records are stored. We've talked about how records are stored within a page. Um, now, how do we store uh, files? Uh, so again, the, each file is basically going to be a collection of records, which has to support a couple of very straightforward operations. Um, Insert, inserting, deleting, and updating records, reading records, and uh, possibly scanning over all records. And the most straightforward uh, way of representing data in a file is to use uh, is what's known as a heap file or an unordered file. Um, and as the name implies, this kind of file stores records in no particular, no specific order. Um, there are a set of pages in the file, and those pages are, um, we allocate new pages as we need them, uh, and we either free pages, or we sort of uh, put them into a temporary pool of, of pages as the file um, gets bigger and smaller. Uh, now, sort of the crucial, uh, the, the, the crucial thing that we need to keep track of here is that the file itself needs to keep track of what pages um, are part of the file. So some, somewhere in the, the we're going to have to come up with some design, some layout uh, for, for data in the file, uh, some layout of pages in the file uh, that can keep track of which pages are, are part of the file. And also which, um, whether there are any sort of free uh, pages that are, are not being used. Uh, and of course, we have to have some way of, of keeping track of which records are on each page, which we've already covered. Um, and all of this information has to be stored within the file itself. So uh, one of the, the most straightforward representations of this kind of data is a linked list. Uh, so we have one page that acts as sort of a directory. And that directory points to uh, two other pages. Uh, one page containing data, and one page can, uh, sorry, one page that is empty. Um, now, if there are more empty pages, then this empty page uh, can just point to the next one, and each of those uh, pages can contain basically a small chunk, uh, a, a small um, index identifier of the next page in the list. Uh, basically, a linked list. The other uh, possible solution is to have, uh, and anyone who's done some file systems work uh, or, or has taken an operating system score should be fairly familiar with this idea, is to have a directory page uh, where you have, um, sorry, have a slightly different structure to the directory page where each directory page points not to uh, just one data page, but rather a whole uh, slew of data pages. And then if we run out of space in the directory page uh, to point to these data pages, we can allocate more directory pages 
uh, using sort of the same sort of linked list idea. Now, typically, the directory, the number of directory pages is going to be fairly small, so keeping a linked list there isn't going to hurt too much. Uh, right. uh, okay, so uh, we have these two general structures. What are some advantages and disadvantages of, of each of them? <coughs> Okay, so the first one is a little more vulnerable to uh, corrupt to data corruption. Uh, say that again. Right. So with a linked list, you're essentially forced to access the data as a full scan. If you're looking for even just one tuple, you still have to load all of the pages into memory. Although in some cases that's not necessarily a problem. It depends on what kind of queries you're asking. Uh, what, are there any advantages to a linked list? Right, so insertion is much, 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 much faster. Um, what about uh, how much space you need? So let's say you're doing a scan. Um, let's say you do actually need to scan the every single page. Um, how many pages would you need to load in uh, for uh, for this hierarchical structure? Let's say, well, let's say you have um, ten data pages, and each directory page can store, let's say, three references. So, okay. So you don't also need to. You wouldn't just need to load in the ten directory pages. Sorry, the ten. Uh, file pages, you'd also need to load in the, the 10 directory pages. Um, and how many page, uh, pages would you need to keep in memory at any given time? Well, uh, at the very minimum. So what, in, in a linked list, how many pages do you need to keep in memory at any given time? Two? One, exactly. We just need uh, the one page that you're currently looking at because as soon as you load the next page in, you're done with it. So essentially the, the first structure is a bit more memory efficient, but the second structure uh, tends to be uh, much more efficient if you're looking for specific values. And uh, This is also going to be more or less the structure of... Um, so how, if you need to store uh, data in a sorted manner or uh, in some sort of organized or clustered uh, which we'll go over a little later in the term, um, that's the structure you use. Okay. So, we've gone over layout uh, of records, pages, and files. Let's wrap it up with one last thing, and that's the system catalog. So, we need... So, we have all of this lay, all of these layout options. We have all of this... Uh, these, these sort of this metadata about various tables, uh, such as the attributes and, and the types of each attribute.